internet law, consumer law, and data law in particular, spun off of much larger firms. My background is in part as a regulator. I was the New York Attorney General's Internet Bureau for about seven years. I've been in house and general counsel out in the Bay Area, data company and a social network. And actually, in fact, I had a virtual world network. Um, and now I'm, I'm back in private practice. And a lot of what I do is help the companies interface with regulators and protect themselves, evaluate products, evaluate regulations, and stay safe. So what I've got planned to talk about today is, in large part, what the FTC, and you could throw state AGs in as well to that mix, are focused on lately and, and what all that means. Um, the laws, in particular, the FTC uh, focuses on the forces, uh, who is liable, who can get caught up in a, in a dragnet around consumer marketing enforcement, um, what types of goods and services garner particular scrutiny. You know, there are certain you know, work from home, uh, diet pills, et cetera, things that, that seem always to be on regulated agendas. Talk a little bit ha about how you describe something and, and when disclaimers work and when they don't work, how that enters into regulated computing. And then the why. So it's who, what, how, and why. Uh, why people are saying what they're saying. In other words, if you have an interest in the product, are you getting paid? Are you getting paid what we talked about a moment ago? Are you getting paid to tweet, to like a product, to post a blog, to post a review, to post a favorable review, etc.? Uh, that's also, that piece is getting a lot of scrutiny. I'll play it as well. I'll, I'll give you know, examples of each of those. But in a nutshell, if I was to boil it down to, to four or five words, what uh, consumer laws tell us is that you shouldn't be deceptive, you shouldn't be unfair, you shouldn't be creepy, and you shouldn't be sloppy. So those are all kind of good, good advice for life as well as for marketing. Um, deceptive, uh, don't say things that are not true, don't make misrepresentations. Unfairness is a fuzzier concept. It applies, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit greater detail, but unfairness is basically when you get something the consumer gets zero. Creepy, privacy laws uh, and privacy enforcement has been very big lately. Everybody from uh, the Senate to the FTC to the state regulators are jumping on the bandwagon to enforce what they see as privacy violations. So that's what I mean by, by creepy. Don't do things that, that creep people out in terms of what you know about them. Don't be sloppy. Don't let, uh, don't be sloppy in your contracts if you get hit with something that is the fault of one of your affiliate partners, etc. So far, so good. So what's perception? FTC Section 5, which is the main uh, section of the FTC Act, it's kind of the catch-all, deceptive practices law, things, you know, just your, your typical run-of-the-mill thing that you would think of as a deceptive marketing practice. And deception is a misrepresentation or omission likely to mislead the consumer who's acting reasonably. The consumer has to be acting reasonably. If consumers have irrationally high expectations, or strange interpretations of an ad, that doesn't count. Uh, the FTC enforces express and implied claims, so claims that don't come out and say something that's misleading, but nonetheless give that clear impression. Um, the FTC gives themselves a little bit of room so that they can enforce things that they simply don't like. They look at the net impression of an ad or a marketing practice. And they ask whether a deception is material or it's just really a small part of the bigger picture. Unfairness, the FTC has deception and unfairness authority. You'd think that deception would be enough, but they have, in certain cases, the ability to enforce a practice that they think is unfair. Now, this is something that, that's unpopular with lawyers and companies because it's such a mushy concept. Life is unfair. And it's very hard to know whether something that you're, you're doing that may seem like you know, you're disclosing everything you should is nonetheless going to be found to be unfair. And there's litigation going on about this, particularly in the privacy area, 
where, um, where companies who've been hit by the FTC who say that not, not maintaining data in a particular way can be an unfair act, and the companies, particularly Wyndham Hotel, is fighting the FTC back and saying, look, consumers are not harmed here, so it can't be an unfair practice. Unfairness is, is where a practice is likely to cause substantial injury, and again, the FTC sees injury or harm as a very broad concept. That's not reasonably avoidable by a consumer. They can't do something, just flick a switch, uh, flick an opt-out, do something to protect themselves easily, and not outweighed by other benefits. If the consumer is getting zero in return for something, then that's another element to this. So the what. We're doing what, how, who, and why. There are certain products that the FTC scrutinize in scrutinizes in particular. Who would venture a guess as to what do these things have in common? So health and safety claims, dietary weight loss claims, work from home, business opportunities. Uh, maybe you could lump in there, you know, do your own resume services. Claims that are hard to test, telling you that you'll save on energy, saying that something is particularly safe for the ozone layer. These are examples, by the way, that the FTC gives on its website. Sweepstakes claims, uh, if you're running a sweepstakes and you're not providing an obvious, free, accessible way to enter, that's always uh, an area of scrutiny for state AGs and the FTC. And, and, and increasingly advertising software, downloadable stuff that, that, you're, that consumers are, are, are in, in some way um, download, software that's downloaded onto users' browsers without always clear and conspicuous notice about the fact that it'll, for instance, serve ads, serve overlay ads, serve templates, do things that affect the way that users see and, and browse the web. What do all these things have, I mean, what do these things have in common? They're all things that focus on um, categories of people that maybe are in some way uh, vulnerable, maybe less so the, the, the last thing, the last two, but, but the, other, the others, I mean, you know, diet pills, health and safety claims, things that cure cancer, things that cure disease, uh, people who are unemployed, maybe targeted for work from home uh, opportunities, that type of thing. So this, that doesn't mean that these things are illegal, and it doesn't mean that these types of things have an elevated legal standard to them. It just means that when you're sending these kinds of offers, uh, the FTC and other regulators have made fairly or unfairly a determination that people may not want these things because they're a little bit bogus. So right off the bat, fair or not, and sometimes more unfair than fair, that's what you're, you're, you know, those industries are contending with. One hot button issue, uh, which, which, which you, Nathan, Nathan, Nathan mentioned, is uh, advert using the word free. So there are particular guidelines at the federal and at state levels about uh, using the word free. If you say something is free, it has to really be free, which is to say you've got to uh, you've got to notify people of all of the relevant conditions up front, adjacent to the word free, next to the word free, uh, all rolled into one. So if you can't say uh, uh, that you, users can get a free product and then later on on the next page, buried in the terms of service, reveal that in order to do that they have to subscribe to a service, you know, for two years, they have to buy something else, that they have to sit through, you know, a two-hour timeshare presentation even, which is considered an expense of, of time and, and energy. Um, so be very careful using the term free because it's kind of a, 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 a lightning rod uh, among regulars. Yes? We, well, you know, I mean, why don't we build Q&A? <laughs> <laughs> We've got... Is the thing, is this adding a Well, it's a different, I mean, it means something else. So risk-free, um, well, let me ask you, so what would you be trying to communicate with risk-free? Uh, like risk-free 14-day trial. And then are users the charged for it? Uh, 495 for shipping and handling. And, and so what's the? And then 14 days later, 
So the risk-free is basically saying, is there a way for users to cancel? So it's like a negative option. So what they would, I, I would say for that, they would probably look less under the, the free regulations and more under the negative option regulations. So if you're, if you're in compliance with the negative option guidelines, then I think you, you'd probably get a pass on it. I haven't seen, I haven't seen cases where it's, where the word free was, you know, like I don't, I don't think risk free is the same as free. I think that, that goes more to the negative option. They're supposed to disclose that, to be yeah. clear. Anything that you would have to pay, give up any time, any resource, any, um, uh, I mean, it's the same, if you think of a downloadable product, anything that you're, you could consider for, you know, what we used to call adware or spyware, that having to view ads or having to have this actual functionality on your computer could be a condition that you're agreeing to. So anything, any extra conditions, that cost you time, resources, money, are supposed to be disclosed up front. So they should have told you that. Privacy is a hot button issue. I'm going to go through a couple of hot button issues that are, you know, hot button over really the last few months and the, and the next few months likely. Um, privacy, how many of you have noticed that over the last really two years or so, there's been an enormous amount of attention on um, online and offline privacy? consumers' data. I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal about two and a half years ago, actually now going on three years ago, began this, uh, this ongoing um, uh, a set of stories called what, what They Know, which basically held under a microscope mobile privacy, uh, mobile platforms, social media, online data, offline data, tracking, et cetera. And that spurred you know, more than a dozen congressional hearings and FTC reports and so on. Um, also, a lot of lawsuits around cookie placement, geolocation data. Increasingly, the focus is turning towards offline data as well. The Illinois Attorney General just uh, began an investigation into how websites are using, uh, potentially selling, potentially tracking a user's health data because they're interested in learning. And this is, this is kind of an outgrowth of, of uh, an ongoing Senate investigation. They're interested in how uh, data companies are compiling lists that they're you know, selling that are out there about users' ailments and medical conditions. So they're trying to get to the bottom of that. I don't know if they will, but, but this is increasingly on the radar, online as well as offline data. So if you're dealing with sensitive data, children's data, health data, uh, financial data, you, you want to really think about your practices and think about A, who you're dealing with, B, the contracts and protections that you have if you're buying data and, and see what type of transparency uh, uh, users might have into how you're handling their data. Also in the, in the area of privacy, COPPA. How many of you know what, what, what COPPA is? It's not pronounced COPPA. It's COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which basically says that if you're taking or handling, so you could be getting it secondhand, data from kids who are under 13 years old, you need their parents' consent. Now until, uh, well, until July 1st of this year, COPPA was, was a fairly straightforward uh, act to comply with. It was almost kind of a sleepy area of you know, the regulatory spectrum because everybody knew, because basically what it said is if you, if you are a children's site and you take personal information from kids, you have to get parental consent. Everybody knew if they were, what was a parental, what was a, a children's site. It's Barney the Dinosaur, it's Sesame Street, it's Toy Story, etc. Everybody knew if they were taking or if they were getting secondhand personal information. Personal information was name, address, uh, email address, phone number, etc. And the parental verification was, was fairly easy and straightforward. You send, usually you send an email uh, to the parent, the parent opts in, and so on. 
that all changed on July 1st in a couple of ways. First of all, uh, what a children's website is has changed because the FCC has adopted this new category of family sites. So even if something's not primarily targeted to kids, but it gets more children under 13 viewing it than average, than is proportionate, then that might be a children's site. So that's driving people crazy, especially in the mobile ecosystem, where you know, you've got all these games and you've got all this animation. And it's very, very hard to know, especially if you're working with these companies, getting data from these companies, showing ads in app through those, uh, those app platforms. What, you know, who's looking at the app? I mean, what is Angry, Angry Birds? This is kind of a prototypical question. Is Angry Birds for kids? Is it for everybody? I mean, there's, I've got lots of stuff that you know, my kids use, my kids are eight, that I sometimes play on their apps too. So that's uh, driving people crazy. The second thing that's changed around COPPA is the definition of personal information. Personal information has always been understood to mean something that identifies you uniquely as a human being where I can reach out to you and contact you knowing who you are. So that's your address, your email, uh, your you know, name, etc. Now it means it, all of that plus unique identifiers. So this has really affected any advertising network or other network that is, you know, identifying, you know, click-throughs, uh, cookies, pixels, etc., and using it for anything except what's called a first-party purpose, which is narrow purposes where you're doing things on behalf of the app or website. And if you're taking that information, especially if you're taking that information across a network, you could be liable for violation of COPPA that, you're, that you know, a publisher or an app or an app platform or an app developer commits. So right now what's going on is a lot of uh, networks are building up these uh, compliance efforts so that they've got you know, something between deniability and, and and, and, you know, better still, a, you know, clear compliance program so that they're not in violation of knowingly violating COPPA. And knowledge is, is important if you're a third party. Um, who is liable? So this is the who of all of this. So tr true or false? I can only, you can only be liable uh, for a violation of, uh, of the FTC Act if you are... Uh, an owner, as an individual, if you're an owner or an officer of the company. True? So the answer is never going to be true. <laughs> or I wouldn't ask it. <laughs> uh, so it, depending, it's dependent on the fact scenario. Uh, any number of parties can be liable for a violation, especially an egregious violation of uh, deceptive practices law. Could be an affiliate network, could be an affiliate, could be individuals, could be owners could be officers, could even be employees, depending on their level of participation in the thing that regulators don't like, the wrongful act, their level of knowledge, their level of assistance. Did they, we're going to see a couple of cases where it was alleged that, that you know, networks and individuals participated in creating websites uh, and relationships that, that, that were the, the source of, of FTC um, activity, and they were held liable along with their company. So the how. So what's, what's deceptive? So I started off by saying that, that there are implicit claims of deception and there are explicit claims of deception. So it's an express misstatement would be my mouthwash prevents cold. An implied statement would be my mouthwash kills germs that cause colds. Another way to have an implied uh, misrepresentation is before and after. Bef you know, b before this is what the person looked like, after this is what the person looked like. You're not actually saying something, but you're creating a very clear impression. Um, also on that before and after, your testimonials, if you have testimonials, if you have photos, if you have examples of what your product does, the FTC, and the FTC has clarified this just over the last year or two, have to be typical. So if you're going to say, look, you know, somebody lost 60 pounds drinking this juice, that you can't just say in fine print underneath results not typical. 
what you're putting out there has to be at least within the range of typicality. Typicality of the average consumer. So the how. Disclaimers, true or false, you can disclaim any statement. No, of course, that's... that's <laughs> um, disclaimer law has become narrower. What I mean by that is that you cannot disclaim a false impression or a false statement. You cannot say something in an ad and then in your terms of service on the next on the next part of the website, et cetera, say, well, this is, you know, lose 10 pounds in a week doing nothing. Well, no, actually you have to diet and exercise. Disclaimers uh, do not work unless they're they're bound up, sort of like the like the scenario with free, bound up adjacent to or made with the, the original misrepresentation. It all has to come at once if it's material. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the why. And this is, um, this is a couple of us had, had some discussion about this. One thing that is very, uh, that's, that's a source of scrutiny by regulators lately is a uh, number of names for it. Advertorials, uh, advertisements that look like actual, that look like actual content but actually are, are sponsored. Um, astroturfing. So astroturfing is, how many of you know what, what astroturfing, this is not a real ad, by the way, this is from the onion. Um, how many of you know what, what astroturfing uh, is? Astroturfing is essentially when companies pay people to create what looks like a grassroots movement, but is actually simply paid, paid advertising. Flogging is another term. Flogging means fake blog. Um, People that create a blog, it looks like something that simply is uh, owned by the individual, created by the individual, based on their kind of free expression, but in fact is sponsored under the table by someone else. The prototypical, or one, at least one of the first examples of this that got a, lo a lot of attention, was a couple, Laura and Jim, New England couple, nice couple, decided that they were going to across the country in their RV. And they were going to take advantage of Walmart's generous policy that they had, still have, of permitting RVs and campers to spend nights in their, in their parking lot. So they started, they started this trip, and they started blogging across America. And then it turned out that uh, Laura's uh, brother, who worked for Walmart, got her a sponsorship. So, so Walmart wound up underwriting this trip. And these folks were getting paid to blog, but they never disclosed the relationship or the payment or what law would call their material connection to Walmart. And when this came out in the news, there were, was a lot, of, uh, a lot of embarrassment. So astroturfing, fake reviews, fake posts, when I say fake, posted by people who have a financial interest who are getting paid to do this. Sock puppets are fake online identities. Blog, again, is a fake blog. So why do people care about this? Why does the FTC really care that much? I mean, there's so much content out there. There's so many reviews out there. There are reviews, you know, being put up there by 12-year-olds who are saying that they're 30. There are reviews being put, out, put up by people who have uh, relationships with companies who are employed by companies who may have a bone to pick with companies and restaurants. I mean, doesn't this all just kind of fade into the woodwork? Is any of it really that material? The reason that regulators care is because there are certain constituencies that they think are important and that they think you know, their words and their language and what they say are important to the integrity of the Internet. So one of those groups is consumers. They like this idea of a crowdsourced way for consumers to express their opinions and for that to be an even more powerful way for consumers to, you know, get information and say consumer reviews. And they want that to be honest and fair and accurate and have a, a sense of integrity. Same thing with, with journalists. Journalists are seen, I mean, when you see a news article, when you see an editorial, when you see, a, you know, a newspaper article or, a, you know, a newscast, there's a certain sense of elevated uh, accuracy that we place on it, because we know that journalists 
have certain ethics. And we know that they're out there, although different journalists may have different agendas, to create news, not to create buzz for a company, or at least to report news. So if editorials start looking like advertising, they really care about that. And there have been rules around that for a long time. Uh, Forty years ago was the first set of uh, guides concerning the, the use of endorsements and testimonials in advertising. And what that looked like 40 years ago was, you know, for people who still read print media, when you have an advertisement and it's adjacent to, to an article, it has to say advertisement and be bordered in a certain way. And now what the FTC has done, and it's done it fairly completely at this point, is bring those guidelines online. So it applies to social media, it applies to uh, online endorsements, it applies to uh, advertising, increasingly what's called native advertising. So there are uh, increasingly platforms like, like BuzzFeed that have to abide by this. If there's an article that's put onto a platform that's authored by, sponsored by an advertiser, that has to be clearly disclosed. And you'll see this if you, if you follow platforms like BuzzFeed, you'll, you'll, you'll see this. What's an endorsement? An endorsement is an advertising message that consumers are likely to believe represents the opinions, beliefs, etc., of a party other than, this, other than the sponsoring advertiser, even if the views are the same. In other words, you're endorsing it and you are not connected to or having a stake in or vice versa the advertiser. And for an, for an endorsement, you have to, if you're a blogger, let's say, disclose connections that are not reasonably expected. What does that mean? It means you have to disclose payment if you're getting paid to review something or post a blog. Um, even if you're simply tweeting, even if you're simply liking something on Facebook, you are required to disclose that. So, for instance, on, on Twitter, you have sponsored SPO uh, hashtags. What the FTC asks is that if you're, if, if you're placing... Uh, Sponsorship, sponsor ad on, on tweet that you, you have the word ad in it. Yes? Um, is this, uh, how, how, um, how does that, it's not, it's not necessarily separate, but how small can you make that? Can you make that as unnoticeable as possible? Well, that's that? an interesting question. So, this is the disclosure that studies show was not effective. That's, so how small? <laughs> That's probably what you're using. So there are no, uh, so that was a timely question, because <laughs> I had the slide ready. Um, there are no particular rules or guidelines put out by the FTC around, especially online, how big your text has to be. There are unwritten rules that say that it should be not significantly smaller than the text that you're generally using. and you know, depending on what you're disclaiming or what you're um, disclosing, uh, you, you, you may want run into a problem where it's considered, you know, true classic fine print. So what yeah. is it? Uh, what is the text is, is the normal size from the rest of the uh, site page, but uh, the placement of the link to that page is yes. say, in the foot. So what they would generally say is that you want it to be adjacent to or in the same area of the actual content. There are certain cases where it's, you know, where in print media you have footnotes and sometimes that's good enough, but it, that doesn't really translate to online media. So, so you, you could have, I mean, there's different ways to do it. I mean, sometimes it works to have a, a hover, you know, over. Um, or something like that, but it, it has to be, that there has to be a clear, a clear way that users are somehow alerted to the fact that, you know, if you're getting paid for this, you may get, may get paid, or, you know, yeah. Does it just do a back text in that disclosure have to appear on the page next to it, like you, like you mentioned, or do a back text, the disclosure can appear at the bottom of the page, or can there be a link that says disclosure, and well, well so, so it, it's going to depend what the content is, right? So if it's a blog, then you could put it at the bottom of the blog. That's a reasonable place to put it. Um, 
So that might be your, your question. So, so for instance, there are, uh, you know, I, I work with some, some large sites that have reviewers that post, that post reviews and they get paid. And part of that invariably, especially for people that post reviews of travel or food, is that they're, they're not paying for their trip to Hawaii. So typically they disclose that below below the article. Some some disclose it up above, but disclosing it below the article in prominent print wouldn't wouldn't be unreasonable. Um, if you're doing something that's much smaller, more granular, like a tweet, then obviously that's that's a different way to disclose. But what, what you wouldn't want to do is is disclose it in a way that's not actually presented to the user. Where the user has to click to see it, uh, where the user has to read a, a term of service or that type of thing. Um, So even if you're a, a reviewer, just to kind of just to kind of emphasize this, you might think that it's implied if you're reviewing, let's say, a game, that you got the game for free. But in fact, the FTC would say, no, 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 that's not implicit, and that's not necessarily inferred by the reader. That should be disclosed. Now they have not. So moving ahead a little bit, they have not. The FTC has not brought. Uh, many cases yet around. They've issued a number of warnings. It feels to me like they're, they're firing these warning shots, getting ready to bring a couple of cases because given the you know, dissemination of social media, the number of people who are, who are posting, the number of platforms that are out there, there's some recognition that people don't necessarily get the message uh, as soon as they put out regulation. So, I th so yes. Is that all within the U.S., or do they, do they cross international borders ever? The FTC doesn't. Um, there have been some interesting cases. I mean, uh, I think it was Samsung, uh, no, I think it was HTC, was hit with some, um, as being investigated for having hired students to post negative reviews about their competitor's products, and that's, and that's, that's in Asia. So, um, it's, so it's kind of going on everywhere. There was even an issue in the, the Russian election. There were, uh, anti, uh, I think, pro-Putin or anti-Putin, I can't remember, uh, <laughs> a post uh, made, you know, made by, the, that became an issue in the Russian election. Um, so the warning shots that the FTC has fired, the first one was an Ann Taylor. Ann Taylor, uh, you know, clothing store boutique, they, they invited lots of people to a premiere and they gave people a special gift as long as they posted to social media within 24, 24 hours. And of course, they did not monitor or advise people to, to disclose the, the free gift uh, or the special gift that they were getting. Uh, another warning shot at Hyundai. Hyundai issued gift certificates to users for including on social media and websites links to Hyundai videos. And then most recently, Nordstrom had a tweet up event where they, they found out who the influencers were using presumably some, you know, like clout or, you know, some, some uh, data company that provides influencer scores and uh, provided $50 to those influencers uh, on, on, on Twitter and did not monitor in any way or advise them to, to disclose the $50. Now, one interesting thing, and I, and, you know, I was saying b before some of you folks got here that, that this is an area of increased scrutiny. Over these last uh, couple of months, clients of mine, I, I've been seeing more and more subpoenas from state AGs in the FTC who are doing ongoing investigations, especially the New York Attorney General uh, and the FTC, about what they see as fake or paid uh, product reviews tweets and, and so on. And the position that they take uniformly is that if you're getting paid to review a product or a book, et cetera, and there are networks that specialize in this, it doesn't matter whether or not you have the freedom to like the book or the product or, or not like it. Just the fact that you're getting paid, positive, negative, for any buzz, is enough to require you to have to disclose that you're getting paid.
Well, these are big companies. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. So, like, if you were small, or would you actually get on the radar screen at all? Maybe there's not this, because I don't think they only have the ones from the board. Yeah, I mean, so I, I mean, I wouldn't make that. I wouldn't make that assumption. I think that no, they. I think yeah, what. What I see is. I mean, so how many folks in this room have, when they were at a company, been the target of, of an FTC or state AG investigation? And how, and how many of you have found it to be just kind of a, a pleasant and educational experience that renewed your faith in the way that, that government fairly enforces? Well, okay, look, fewer hands. So um, the difficult, so you're, you're, I think you're, you're correct to a point I think that the FTC or a regulator is more likely to throw back the small fish because it, at a certain point it's not worth their time. On the other hand, uh, you're going to get caught up in the net and you're going to have to pay money to get out of it. And that is not only an expense of time and resources, but it can be sometimes worse than those two things, a huge distraction in your organization. Because you're straight jacked, you know, well if, well, if I do this thing that normally I'd feel okay doing because it's an elevated level of risk, but I'm okay taking that on, I can't do it now because I've got to tell the FTC this. So now you, you're dealing with this watchdog uh, over your age. And if these cases do not, you, even if you get thrown back, you don't get thrown back in, in three months or, you know, you get, it's a long and tedious process. So it's not a fun thing to be dealing with. And you could also, even if they throw you back, these, to the extent that they might have uh, dropped subpoenas on these little guys, uh, they still had to comply, which means you still got to get a lawyer and do everything right. So um, three things that are the focus of everything we've been talking about by state AGs and the FTC, particularly the New York AG, Doctors and health practitioners, there have been a number of investigations into, uh, into doctors who supposedly, and they haven't made any, any, any cases yet, ask their patients to tweet, to, to tweet for them and, and provide some sort of service in return. And in particular, where those, those or other types of, of businesses, higher reputation management companies, search engine optimization providers, some re there's this sense by regulators right now that there are a number of reputation providers that are actually providing this service of, of fake reviews, hiring ODESC or other you know, offshore providers who are instructed or you know, kind of in, in, <laughs> uh, looking the other way and while this is going on and, and, and folks are providing fake reviews to boost uh, search, engine, um, search engine placement. We're going to see more of that. The media has, I mean, one way to, to test whether uh, an idea or a regulatory concept has taken hold is, is media scrutiny. There's been increased media scrutiny on this. New York Times did a couple of articles last year on uh, book reviews and other product reviews that, were, that were, were being bought, were being paid for. This is the Samsung, so it wasn't HTC, it was Samsung. Apologize, this is in Asia, uh, for posting fake negative reviews of its competitor FTC, HTC's devices. They had hired students uh, by the hour to do that. Very embarrassing to that company. So many of you probably have followed the As Asai Berry debacles over the last couple of years where you know the FTC really made an example of uh, affiliate networks and marketers and individuals who were marketing those products. And, you know, in part it was because they didn't, I guess, like the product and the product fell into the sweet spot of, you know, health claims being made that weren't supported. But in part it was also the perfect storm of that along with methods that it was starting to focus on, which are these, these methods involving uh, news, you know, advertorials, fake news, news three, we think, we think, or some people think, that this is coming from a news organization, and it's, it's not. Consumer news, um, exposed 
a uh, Great Falls Lady, um, etc. And these are all, of course, advertisements that are made to look like uh, actual editorial. Now, the New York AG has been particularly active in this area, as I mentioned before. The first case that they brought, which was one of the first cases in this kind of advertorial astroturfing um, model, was uh, a case against Lifestyle Lift, which is a uh, company that, that does plastic surgery, facelifts, that type of thing. Then their uh, CEO told his employees to put on your wig and skirt and tell them about the great experience you had. And as a result, these employees went out and tweeted and they posted to Facebook and a couple of them even started their own website, none of them indicating what their material connection was, that they were employees of this company. So that company had to pay a $300,000 fine. And that's a company that's, that's you know, smaller than Nordstrom's and some of the other you know, Hyundai major companies that, that we were looking at. Who? Who can be liable under these cases? The FTC, again, has thrown a particularly broad net, not only uh, looking at and charging the, the entities that, that, that profited, the marketers, in other words, primary profited and, and from and put the goods into the market, but also affiliate networks. Uh, if they, and and it, it, if, whether or not you're going to be caught in a net like this is going to depend on your level of knowledge, your level of participation, uh, whether or not you have any kind of credible story as to you know, policies that you had or actions that you took in order to not have this type of thing happen. So in this particular case, the allegations were that the affiliate network recruited affiliates, okay, that's obvious, um, negotiated terms of the contract, and assisted in promoting and setting up the website. So there was very clear knowledge of what was going on, and they really participated almost as an actor, or something more than an affiliate, more than simply you know, a, a, a passive network. What's interesting in some of these cases is that not only the uh, companies, but the individuals, individuals were charged. And in some of these cases, it wasn't only owners, and it wasn't only CEOs. It was people on down the line who had significant amounts of participation in the uh, violations. And that's, that's not necessarily that common, but it does happen. If you're an employee, by the way, there's this tendency to assume that, well, you've got an indemnification uh, agreement, presumably, not necessarily so. That's based on what a company's bylaws say. Many companies' bylaws only indemnify officers or certain officers. It's often unclear in smaller companies who's an officer. Now, I've worked with companies that are 40, uh, 40, 40 people large, and 15 of those people are vice presidents. But none of them are really vice presidents because the only way to appoint vice presidents under the bylaws is by ratification of the board of directors. So you may even think that you're an officer and you're going to be indemnified by the company, and that may simply not be the case under corporate bylaws and, 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 and contract law. Um, in this particular case, the owner and president was a defendant. Yeah, that's not going to protect you. The corporate structure is not going to protect you from being named as a defendant. And that doesn't necessarily, when I say named as a defendant, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to pay a fine. Very often, individuals who are named in FTC complaints do not have to pay a fine, or very often there's some amount of fine that's set out in the consent order, but it's effectively waived so long as you're, you're effectively on probation for some number of years but you're carrying this thing around with you. It's negative publicity. Uh, you don't want that on your reputation. You may have record-keeping uh, requirements. You may have to notify the FTC of other uh, companies, other jobs that you take in the future in a particular area. So it's, it's, it's if, you know, when, when you're negotiating these things, it's, it's important to look at all of the parties and, you know, dismiss out as many parties as you can. In this particular case, again, uh, the affiliate marketers and the affiliate networks were, uh, were targeted by the FTC because both of them 
participated in setting up and operating websites. These are allegations, of course. We don't know necessarily what's behind all of this. Uh, and both of them obviously received commissions. Both of them were aware of what was being presented to consumers and aware of what the products actually offer. Uh, in this case, individuals, the president, the CEO, and the CMO were all charged. But there are other cases where non-officers, just people who were running business deals, were named. That's not very often the case, but it sometimes happens. Some cases go the other way. These were actually two cases that I was involved in. These are two cases that actually went to litigation and went to court decision, which of course by the time that happens, companies are often bankrupted based on the, the negative publicity, not to mention the expense. But in both of these cases, the courts actually said, well, you know, you're not, if, if you're a network, or a you know a marketing network, an affiliate network, a uh, a software uh, distribution network, uh, software in this case ad adware network, you are not liable for what your independent contractors do. You can call them affiliates, you can call them contractors, but you are not going to unless you have a very elevated level of knowledge and probably participation. You're not going to be liable for their acts. You're going to be liable for your acts. Now, cases go the other way, but I, I show you these cases just kind of to demonstrate a couple of things. First of all, the law is very fuzzy as to who is an agent of whom and who has liability for whose actions under the law, but also to demonstrate that as far as the FTC is concerned, a wide net is, is, is appropriate, even if they are perhaps stretching what, what state common law would say. So I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about how you can protect yourself, just from a very practical standpoint. So I work with a lot of companies that kind of understand the first 30 slides. But all of that is potentially useless if you don't take very practical steps to protect yourself. Um, contracts matter. When you're doing a deal, it's very tempting to not really care what's in, in a contract. For that matter, privacy policies are important. And this is something I meant to say before, but many of us gloss over privacy policies if we're dealing with data because we say to ourselves, nobody's ever going to read it. The FTC cares about them because in cases where the FTC doesn't like a particular, uh, a particular practice, a particular way to share information, use information, place cookies, whatever it is, they may have 30 or 40 companies that they know did the thing that they don't like. But instead of relying on, remember, unfairness jurisdiction, which basically means we don't like it and we think it's kind of unfair, they would rather rely on an actual misrepresentation. And to find that, they don't look at the company that's biggest or that did the worst things the most times. They look at the company that messed up in their privacy policy by saying that they wouldn't do the thing that they did do. Same thing goes for terms of service. So it's very important to have those terms uh, down pat and to have them aligned with what you're actually doing. Same thing goes for your, your standard contracts, whether it's an affiliate uh, agreement, whether it's a, a reseller agreement, a marketing agreement, whatever it is. Uh, it's important to have you know, really just a couple of paragraphs that are really important. What type of license you're giving companies to your website, to your data, et cetera. Uh, what reps and warranties you're getting from them, what they're promising not to do and to do, and what indemnities you get. Now, if, you, if regulators go after you, indemnities are not necessarily going to be that effective, but they're effective in other cases if somebody else sues you. What, from a practical standpoint, one thing that's helpful, that sometimes works for companies that are sometimes dealing with much larger uh, networks or you know, marketers, is to have an appendix of the four or five things that you absolutely need to absolutely need to have, see, get from whoever you're dealing with. So that, you know, if you don't want to hire a lawyer every time you do a contract, you just have this, this set of overriding terms that's always going to apply and you attach it as an appendix. And you know, notwithstanding anything in the contract, you will do these four things, you will not do these four things. And that sometimes works organizationally. Another thing, and this sounds maybe a little bit basic, but I can't tell you the number of companies that I've worked with internally and externally 
they kind of get everything right. Their contract is great, but it's never signed. It, the, the compliance ends when you sign the contract and send it out. And you don't wait to get it back. And that's important because, you know, six months later, if, you know, not only if there's a regulatory mess, but if you want to get paid or if there's a payment dispute or a licensing dispute, you need to have a signed contract. And it's embarrassing to tell whomever, the CEO or marketer or whoever it is, that you didn't get a signed contract. Now, the reason we don't get signed contracts isn't because we're, is not because we're stupid or lazy. It's because it's kind of a pain. Right? You gotta, it's like an eight-step process. You've got to print out the document. You've got to sign, sign it. You've got to take it to the scanner. You've got to wait for it to scan. You've got to pick it up. You've got to to back back to the computer, send it to the other side, have them print it out, sign it, scan it, email it back. So invest in, and I'm not shilling for these companies, but invest in, uh, at once you get some amount of contract flow, particularly if you're dealing with standard agreements, invest in EchoSign or DocuSign or something like that. It's really easy and it's really simple and it tracks uh, and, and, and you know, maintains your, your contracts. And from a legal standpoint, that's really important. Well, different kinds of insurance um, are are important depending on what you do. But it's 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 important to know what what insurance coverage you have. So, for instance, a lot of companies get E and O insurance and comprehensive general liability insurance. That covers certain things. That'll cover like if you, if you have a fire or something, or if uh, you know somebody s maybe sneaks into your office and steals something somebody trips and falls on your stairs, it won't necessarily cover a lawsuit against you based on advertising. There's something called product, adver product slash advertising insurance, which certain courts have actually interpreted as being very broad. It depends on the exact terms of the insurance that you've got. But that's, if you're dealing with these kinds of issues or you're facing the public, you want to ask your broker about whether you need product advertising insurance, product slash advertising. Well, no, then you, you can't, ins unfortunately, you can't insure against that. You can try to get, try to put into your indemnification agreement that you get indemnified for costs of an investigation. <coughs> Most indemnification clauses do not have that. I try to put that in. Sometimes it gets crossed out, but uh, investigatory costs is not in your standard uh, indemnification language, but it, in some cases it should be. So, earnings closures, and I mentioned this part of the earnings closures, that have to be separate from It should not be part of terms and conditions. No. It should be disclosed in some way up front, somewhere in the body, adjacent to the body, next to the body, within the body, over the body, under the body, but somewhere in, in that, uh, that frame of sight. Well, if you're talking about sponsored content, yes, sponsor, exactly. Sponsored by uh, advertisement. Um, I mean, sponsored by is probably the, the most uh, elegant way to do it. Uh, if you're getting a gift, just, you know, I, I, I just, just, I mean, there's no, so for instance, if you're a blogger and you got a, and let's, let's consider this the, the Q&A session now. If you're a blogger and you got a free trip to Hawaii, it shouldn't be skin off anyone's nose for you to say, these guys paid for my trip to Hawaii because no one's reading a review thinking, I'm not going to believe what this person says because she got, I mean, it's presumably accurate. It's, you know, you're, uh, so it's, it's worth doing and it shouldn't detract from the content and the message and the purpose. And let's, folks, have questions about this, about anything, about uh, consumer regulations, about uh, investigations. When, now, when you say earnings disclosure, you mean like your SEC disclosure? No, no, it's more like affiliate earnings, you know, which is, you know, if you're listening to your website, you make more money off of that. Oh, right. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I guess that's another way to do it. Anything that's, that's, I, I think it depends. Yeah, yeah it, it's, the it's, the trick is to not put too much in up front that it just gets muddled and looks yeah. strange. So. You, so you want to have, like, you can have a link with a few words. 
you know, you figure out an elegant way to say it, you know, earnings, uh, what, what was the phrase that you used? Yeah, you know, I would say like earnings, earnings from posted content, something like that. I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily just say earnings disclosure. I would add probably a couple, like two or three other words to it. Yeah, that would be an even clearer way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways you could say. It. You know, earnings, earnings from posted content, uh, earning what. Well, Phrase you use to say that's yeah that's a that's an even more yeah, clear like straightforward way. Because I had a, a known similar experience with Facebook, and I was like, I don't know if you can say that on your website, but I was like, well, everything. Yeah. Well, people do that. I mean, every one of the companies in here had an attorney <laughs> at some point, so. Attorneys give all sorts of advice, and there's you know spectrum of advice between more careful to to. The left here. So, does Swoop Ten or do you buy like a uh, a review of a website in sure. terms of you know, it's how accurately it's matching up with FTC disclosure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we do site reviews all the time. We do that, and we do it for uh, you know for with a number of purposes in mind. We do it to look at representations, at representations. We do it to, to make sure. The basic stuff to make sure that all your links are, are, are up. We often find links down to look at uh, COPPA, to, to, to you know if you're a certain kind of site that might be targeted to kids, or sometimes have a particular feature that's targeted to kids. Right, there are sites that have kids club or something like that. Probably not the sites that you do, but maybe uh, that that there's that review. There's terms of service. There's privacy policies. What well, one thing I've found that's not that unusual is. Sites have very old and outdated privacy policies or terms of service, and it's just you're better off not having anything up there at all, which which runs in, runs you afoul potentially of, of certain California laws, than having something up there that's not true, which runs you afoul of every law in the country. Do you have a package where you you have like kind of like a generic terms of service privacy people for a Yeah, I mean, there's not really any such thing as a, as a generic term of service because everybody's got, I mean, it's, you know, a terms of service for a game site is going to be different from a terms of service for a sweepstakes site or retail site from a, you know, site that has puzzles or uh, videos that has user-generated content. It's, you don't want to have too much. You, you want to have in there, in there what you need because you don't want to overpromise. So there's, there's really no such thing. It would be like a generic, you know, contract or a generic. It's, it's just. I mean, there there are certain templates. There are certain generic clauses, absolutely. But 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 it's not the sort of thing that it's not like a Mad Libs kind of plugin. Anybody remember Mad Libs? Oh, yeah. like oh, okay. Kids love them. Um, well, I think we're I think we're. Done. But anybody that wants to that wants to stay and has any other questions, please. Oh, oh I think we don't stay. Anybody that wants to stay, don't stay. <laughs> but but we'll, I'll, we'll be out in the hall though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.